Hi, I'm Christina Applegate. And I'm Jamie Lynn Sigler. And this is Messy. So today is a really special episode of Messy. It's our first guest. Uh, we got to sit down and have a beautiful conversation with the one and only Edie Falco. She played Carmela Soprano, my mother, on The Sopranos. Uh, we worked together for almost 10 years, and um, she brought it, man, huh? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's a listen, guys. It's a listen. Here's Edie. Mm-hmm. I'm just so honored to have you here, Miss Edie Falco. Welcome. Thank you so much. It is an honor to have been asked. Oh, well, Edie, I have to tell you. So this podcast is called Messy um, because life is messy. We are messy. But it really came from a place where Christina and I, you know, feel like as women, as we age and we discover that deep, meaningful conversations are where all of our growth and self-acceptance can really come from. Um, And when we would start each conversation with how are you, we would actually hold the space and feel free to actually say how we were. And there's very many moments in our lives where we don't answer that question truthfully for a myriad of reasons. And so this is that space. This is that place where we say, how are you? And we talk about that. And not to, you know, eat up all of this intro time, but I just want to talk right now and then we'll get through with it. But in my own kind of healing journey, I'm doing this reckoning with my past and trying to understand, you know, like what actually happened versus maybe my perception of what had happened. And I know you and I each personally, we all on the show and everybody went through personal things during those 10 years. And for me, there was a divorce and a diagnosis of MS and symptoms starting to show. And um, I was young and trying to do the best I could and, and muscling up and showing up to work and not telling anybody um, what was going on. And I'm so happy to talk to you today as women, because even though you played my mother and you were somebody I look up to, I really feel like now like we're peers, like we're we're mothers and and actresses and friends. And so I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. But I really my first question to you is what was your perception of me during that time? I saw you as a highly functional, like type A young woman who I, it's funny, I I found myself, there was a distance between you and I when we worked. Yeah. Um, It was not on purpose, uh, but I think first of all, because you had your real mom and your real mom was around. She was a, you know, she was a figure on set and I never wanted to, you know, portend to be more than an actress playing your mother. So there was that, but also you, you know, portrayed yourself, yourself, not the character, as so competent, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So hardworking, so like that. And the truth is when I was a kid in high school, I was a, I was a weirdo. And, you know, I came from a crazy family and I, I just, I felt like everybody could tell that I was a weirdo and I would meet, girls like you and I was terrified of them. The ones that just, they felt, they just made me, they just looked like they knew what was going on. They knew how to be with people. They knew how to function at a high level and always do a good job. And I, you know, so to be honest with you, since we are all women and at a certain point, we all become the same age. Mm -hmm. I was intimidated by you. Oh my God. Wow. That is the truth. That is that is wild to me because I was just such a little mess inside. Uh, I was, I felt so undeserving of every moment that I was there. I was waiting to be found out that like I shouldn't have been there or should didn't like belong. And I I was doing the artist way workbook a cup uh, last year. And you know, when one of the morning pages it asked, it prompted you to um, 
write a letter to somebody that inspired you artistically or creatively at a time in your life. And immediately this moment came to my mind. I don't know what season it was, but I'll never forget. I came home, I was going through my divorce and I came home to my apartment in New York and I had a message on my answering machine and it was you, Edie, and you were telling me how well I did in the episode that had just aired that night and how proud of you you were of me. And that, I cannot tell you that single moment. I meant to send you the letter. I still have it in my nightstand that I wrote in this workbook because it made me keep going. It was a time where they were calling in acting coaches to the set for me because I couldn't tell anybody what was wrong, but people could tell something was wrong and they didn't know how. And I read this interview with you where I'm so sorry that you, when you were going through breast cancer and you were, a lot of that was, you know, quietly that Jim called you out and said, something's up. And he did the same thing to me. Wow. The same thing to me. He pulled me aside one day and said, something is wrong and you're not telling anybody. And I need you to, and I did in that moment, I told him. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. But I have to thank you for that message. It's funny. You never know. Cause you you don't, you see something like, God, that's great. If you take the split second to tell the person that you're thinking, cause I, so, you know, I don't do it and I'm sure, you know, it passes. And I thought, we're working together. You gotta, I gotta at least let this kid know how fucking great that was. And you never think it has any reverberations beyond that. And I'm thrilled to know it's something you remember. I mean, uh, you know, you never know. I did it because I wanted to, not so that it would affect you in a certain way. But Of course. And it's just, it's so meaningful to me to have this conversation with you because I, di- I think I desperately wanted to be close to you and to everyone, but I just didn't know how. You know, and it was one of those moments where I just, if you wish you could go back and tell yourself, like, no one's, people will love you more if you share your heart. And I just, I just was afraid to just be set aside if people would know that I wasn't perfect. Of course. And you, everybody, they're alone in that. I I don't know how either one of you, like, you know, I, Edie, you know, I had breast cancer as well and was working at the time. Yeah. In 2008. And, you know, I have MS and um, all happening while I'm working. And I don't know how both of you, like for me, I had to tell everybody because I'm like, I'm going to be acting like a freako, sobbing in the corner every 20 minutes. Just want you to know that this is what's going on. But I don't know. I, I don't know. How did you like, how did you like keep your composure through all of it? Because I know, I mean, I'm asking you, Edie, and of course you, um, because I, I know that when I was going through it and I had my double mastectomy and everything, like I had to go back to work like only a couple of weeks later, you know, and I'm in incredible pain and, you know, with MS, I'm falling over. I don't know how you guys could have done it without like letting someone in on the, on, on it so that you felt protected. I don't know. It's I I, like, think it's incredible. Uh, I, and I had, I have always wished I was able to, to be like that, you know, where I would tell people, listen, I'm struggling. I'm going to need your help. Or, you know, uh, or at least you'll know what it is and maybe we'll have slower work days or whatever. But I come from, you know, you just work. You just work and work and work and work. You don't tell people you're struggling. No, no. I mean, I get that part. Like married with children, we were not allowed to speak. It was like, if you asked for an orange juice, someone would be like, you have legs. Like (laughs) you could be on your deathbed, 104 fever at work. And they're like, yeah, no, you do that. So yeah. I, mean, I totally get that. I think, I think, I don't know what it is like in the last few years, just, I'm like, you know what, honestly, it's, it's, it's Jamie a lot. You know, when, when uh, I found out I had MS and um, she said, you gotta, you gotta set boundaries at work because now you, you, you can't anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, you yeah. always had that. No, no, no. I, I, that is a very different. That is a very different situation too. Like I, I, uh, I knew, or at least I assumed that this, that I was going through something that would have an end. I think I knew at that point it wasn't going to kill me. I had gone through surgeries and all that. I just knew it was going to be painful and messy, perfectly named uh, at that time. And I, I don't do well when people are like, oh my God, how are you doing? So just 
I can't, I can't, Yeah. I, I don't function well. I don't know. I'm, you know, thank God I'm in therapy to understand why it's not okay that people know I'm struggling. Um, they probably wouldn't know until I literally fell down and, you know, yeah, I need to go through it without people babying me. I couldn't, I, I think that would have made it worse for me. Oh yeah. No, I, I, I couldn't have done that either, but it was like, almost like my survival. Like I had to be like, you guys can't hug me. And if I fall into a wall, you can't, totally. you, need to know, you know, whatever, but I held so many secrets too. I mean, and I think as a woman and a woman, female actresses, we're not allowed to say anything because then we're the, the, the eye rolling from the male department is pretty yeah. big. So yeah, I totally want to be hard to work with. Yeah. You don't right. want, yeah. So I held in, you know, abusive relationships I was going through and, you know, knots on my head. So I get it. But um, why do we have to do that? What is that thing? Why? It's so bigger than so much bigger than us. I know. I find, you know, I actually feel like I don't, I don't like, I say I know the answer to that, but I might know a little bit of that answer because I can see with my husband then when he asks me how I am and I deeply share, he wants to be able to help and handle that, but he can't. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard, I think for some men to process your answer. Yeah. It's not that they don't want to. He, he, he wants nothing more than to help me, but sometimes I, I, it's, he's not the one for me to go to because he can't handle that information. That, that book that was going around women are from Venus, men are yeah. from our, whatever, that movie, that, that book was the one interesting overriding point was that oftentimes you just want to share your mind space with someone like it would be nice if if you know a man could say god that must be so hard um, why don't you just sit against me for a minute and we'll just watch some tv or let me make dinner or something like i don't want you to fix that problem you can fix that problem i eventually will manage it or we'll find the person but can you just listen to the fact that i'm struggling that's all i want is i want you to know that i'm in that brain space and to occupy it with me. It's the this thing about men often wanting to solve it. Yeah, they want to get their toolbox out. And yeah, you're like, yeah, that's not what I'm asking. Yeah, your just, solutions suck, by the way. So yeah, just let me talk. Right. That's right. And, and they want it done and they want it done fast and they want to do it. So yeah. it's often easier just not to say anything. Well, yeah, that sucks, bro. When, when you think back to The Sopranos, I'm wondering, because whenever I think back to it, it's just all about the personal relationships it like has nothing to do with the enormity of the show or how people regard it it's just right. like if anything i just wish i could go back even just for one episode know. just you know just one just one one day to be, go back as the person i am now yes 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 you know? i just I got it i got it just uh, one one meal scene. With yes, me. yes, <laughs> yes. But you know, I I am a great believer in in uh, the order of things being what they are, and it is not ours to to know necessarily. And you are given experiences in your life when you're meant to, mm -hmm. however poorly we may think we handle them at the time. I think that's what it was supposed to be, and maybe so that you can land where you are now with such um hindsight you know yeah. i don't really know but i know when i've tried to meddle into that like you know and i totally get it if i wish i could be the person i am now in so many of my past situations mm -hmm. but um, who's to say i would be the person that i am now if i didn't go through those things then you know what i mean of course but i do i i do wish i could have had my own back back in those days when i was feeling less than and you know and, you know, a very social atmosphere, one that I did not fit in, you know, and I felt like I, I just didn't know how to do it or whatever. And I, but I, in all these years later, I wonder if everybody didn't feel that way in, oh. in, in regard, you know what I mean? I think everyone except Robert. <laughs> everyone except Robert. Because Robert's like, he's my hero. I tell him all the time. I was like, give me an ounce of you. He just uh. gives zero fucks. He doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. He doesn't even think about what anybody thinks about him. But I know exactly what you mean. But I can tell Edie, you, Edie, from my perspective and the rumors going on around you and what I would hear, you were our queen. You were 
untouchable with your talent, which the world knows, but just kind and professional and always there Mm. in, in a scene with everybody. And so whether you felt that way or not, and I understand because I felt that way a lot of the time, um, that was not the perception of you at all. If anything, you were above us all and we weren't worthy. You have a, you have a daughter? I do. I have a 12 year old daughter uh-huh. and, um, she's way cool. She's just yeah. the coolest kid. Um, She's got really good taste in music. This is the most important thing because you don't, the last thing I want to do is listen to shit music in my house from coming from her room. So thankfully she's like listening to the Pixies and Nirvana and like the Beatles and Mama Del Rey and like just, and I'm like, oh, thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. That's not what I'm hearing. I know. I know. know. The alternative. teenagers, Edie, huh? The 15 and 18. Oh my God. I was so sure somehow. My kids wouldn't be mean, but um, yeah, yeah, no, they're right on target. <laughs> oh, mine's mine's early. <laughs> uh-huh. The f bombs, the f bombs at mommy happen. Uh, you know, the eye rolling, like oh my god, you don't understand. Like it's, uh, you know, I like, don't know. yeah, okay. So it means we did a good job. You know That's what I mean? Right. They feel comfortable to do to to speak back and speak their mind. How old are your sons now? Jamie? Ten and five. Oh, right. fun five, fun five. I love five. I know. I, I had having the, I mean, perspective of a 10 year old, which probably seems like so silly to you two having teens pretty much. But I look at my five year old and like his hand still doesn't have knuckles. You know, I'm like <laughs> holding on to like, I totally get oh it. The little baby things that he still has a little bit. Like he just lost his first two teeth. So cute. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. five. And then to know that we're not going to get that back, like freaks me out. Like that Sadie's yeah. like coming in and like straightening her hair in my room, but like also she's kind of tough and kind of, you know, tomboy, like, but like that little, that little voice, you know, that it's gone. She's like, yeah, Nobody dude, what, cares bro? About <laughs> Nobody talks about that. It, it really is. I've talked to friends who have kids who just went off to college and nobody talks about when those little kids disappear uh, that like, it's like a death, you know, They're, like even the kids themselves don't remember those kids, but they were such a, you know, early parenting stuff is it's madness, oh. but it's some of the most like divine, precious um, hours of my life when they both fall asleep on you as you're watching TV and it's quiet and you realize, oh my God, I didn't know this could, I could feel this, uh, this love, this size, you know? Right. Yeah. And then there- and they're just gone forever and ever and they're just memories and they're all over your iPhone. Well, I told Sadie that when she goes to college, wherever it is, I'm going to be, I'll be moving in with her. And <laughs> I highly encourage um, Los Angeles based um, universities. And I'm like, why would you want to live in a dorm when we have our nice house? Like, why would you want to do that? So I'm doing everything I can to just make her planning all the seats. They'll never need therapy or anything. So no, that's right. no never. <laughs> well, I have a I have a good mentor friend of mine who tells me, Jamie, no matter what you do, your kids will be in therapy about you. You'll either, <laughs> you'll either spend, pay too much attention to them or too little attention to them. It literally doesn't matter. They're going to blame you for everything. Just do your best. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sadie's already told me what she's going to say in therapy when she starts therapy. There you go. Like it's already like planned out. I was like, wait, how do you remember that? you know, something that happened when she was four. She's like, oh, I remember everything. And she <laughs> thought maybe she wasn't listening. Oh yeah, they got it all. No, yes. she's like, you know, it's all going to be discussed. <laughs> Thanks a lot, kid. That's right. Well, Christine, I know you wanted to talk to Edie about the impact Nurse Jackie had. Oh shit, I can't even. Edie, I have to tell you, like, first of all, one of, if not my favorite show that I've ever seen in my life, like diehard, crazy town fan. Wow. Um, but- besides you being just so brilliant on it and funny and heartbreaking and all the things, there was not a character like that on television as a woman. There was not a character that was our hero and was flawed as fuck and, and pained and all of that. And I think that by you having this beautiful balance of all those things that we got to really root for, for Jackie and, and root for her, like, 
I, I was like, no, go back to doing drugs. Like seriously, like crazy <laughs> things in my head. <laughs> I think that if that hadn't happened, it wouldn't have opened the doors for shows like how to get away with murder. And, and it quite honestly dead to me was like, there couldn't have been that character that I would have never been able to do that. Had you not like trailblazed oh. that women can be imperfect and fucked up and also our hero that we, that we root for constantly. And thank you. so I just wanted to say thank you for that. Cause oh, thank you. That's it, lovely. It, it changed the game. Edie. It really did. It changed the game. Oh, you know, I, you, who, what else could, uh, I mean, you guys know what else could an actor ask for, but to hear that what you did moved somebody. Cause it's more than just like, you know, and well, you know, I made this much money. I got to shoot in this great play. And, you know, at the end of the day, what are you, what are you looking at when it's all said and done? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Was anybody moved in any way by anything I said or did, you know what I mean? 100%. That's what else you can ask for, you know? What was it like? I mean, when you first read that, because it was so different than anything that was on television. I mean, you had to really trust in the in that to to know that people were going to really gravitate. Like, what was that? What was that like for you when you first read it? Like, what was your feeling of here's this nurse who's a drug addict? Like, it's insane. Like, that's well, the thing is, the original script was was she wasn't a drug addict. Oh, it was very very different. It was called Nurse Mona, believe it or not, and it was written by um, a, a friend's neighbor. So it was one of those things like, oh, my neighbor wrote a script that he wants you to read. And it's that like, oh, God. Oh, shit. And, uh, and my friend said, you know, no, I think you might want to read it. It's kind of good. So anyway, that was how it was. And she wasn't a drug addict. And she had this thing where she could feel the aura of people. She could tell things about them. She used to steal something from each patient and put it in a drawer. It was completely different. Oh, wow. A place along the line. Uh, it was made into a half hour comedy. Now, I don't know <laughs> how that happened, but um, that was what I guess they were buying um, at the time. And that then drugs came into it. It was not part of the original deal. Um, and I was, as each change, each new script came along, I was still finding her compelling enough to want to play it, you know, and to think that people would be interested in her journey. But um, because drugs and alcohol have had a big impact on my life, uh, not just in myself and my family and friends. Uh, I, I didn't want it to be just funny, you know? Um, so I told them, as long as we treat this as the very important issue that it actually is, I'm, I'm game for this. And that's kind of how it came to be. Wow. What was the, um, you had the two women who wrote, um, I know one of them, but my brain doesn't, it's, I can't Linda remember. Wallen? Linda Wallen? No, yeah. And Liz Brixius. Yeah, Linda Wallum. I know. There's I, also a Liz Flayhive who also okay. wrote. I know Linda had, there was like, she was, had a personal, I don't know. She could support the idea. I know that because I knew her, but that's not. Okay, okay. great. That's right. That's okay, right. But I well, mean. all three of us were that. It, by yeah. All three of us. Back in the early days, we were like, let's tell the story of what it's like to not do that anymore. You know, that's, but, you know, it changed forms many times. It really, I, I mean, I was. I was so sad when it ended because it really was my appointment TV. And I don't, yeah, I don't do I appointment TV. I'm like, oh, it's on once a week. I can't yeah. wait that long. But yeah. I would just wait. I was like, my husband and I would just like, oh my God, it's Nurse Jackie Knight. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh, that was like Breaking Bad, I think was like our two like things that you weren't allowed to watch without the other person. That was our Netflix and chill kind of thing. It was our moment, so. It's very sweet. Also great. I mean, it was great fun. I mean, as you move through your life from job to job, you want to think there's something about each of them that maybe is a little better than the last one. You've learned how to either how to walk yourself through the world differently mm. or I mean, I was also involved in a lot of the cast, the, the hiring of the crew and stuff. And so I had a lot of people that I have come to love over the years. You know, it's a lot of hours in the same place with yeah. these people. Might as well get who you like. I told I do the same thing every job. Absolutely. No more time for the bullshit, you know, <laughs> no for the, for the egos and all that stuff. So in, in that regard, it was a, a fantastic job. Great place to show up every day. Edie, as someone who I think is we've talked about, like similarly, like how we kind of muscle through some stuff when we get to work. But our work is is ourselves, right? Our body, our, our, our emotions. How do you, how do you possess the freedom that you have in, in the work? I've, I just always marveled at it. I mean, you made 
you made me a better actress when I was across from you. The only reason why I think I ever gave any of the performances I did was because of all of you around me. But there's just this really free, like disarming presence that you you bring when you're across from you. And I just, I'm still figuring out how to have that while I'm holding myself personally together. Do you know what I mean? I do. I do. Uh, and first of all, those are very, very kind words. I don't want to not say that because it's, it will never not feel great to hear that. So I appreciate that. Um, well, remember I've got, uh, 20, 20 something years on you. I think uh, that I have been doing this. Yeah. And over the years, you start to feel more valuable. You realize I'm still doing this and there must be something people are paying me uh, to do this thing. And there must be something effective in it. I don't know what it is. I don't know how you access it. I don't know how to write about it in a book. I don't know. I just know if I take care of my inner life, then I will continue to have access to this thing. So as I, as that becomes that, that acceptance becomes fuller and richer in me, that's what I'm carrying to everything I do. You know, it's, for those of us who've been through any kind of trauma, family trauma, relationship trauma, trust issues are big, you know, yeah. but this is the one thing that really, it cannot be, it can't be taken from me. Uh, it's mine and I nourish it, you know, and um, it thus far has never let me down. Uh, you know, I am getting older. So now I have to wear glasses, you know, on to read or whatever. And, um, memorization is getting a little bit harder but uh none of that matters because i still have this thing that i friggin love and thus far people continue to pay me for it so there is a uh, there's a confidence it's a level of confidence you walk in i also feel like if i'm in there and i'm not getting the feeling that it's being received in a way that is positive i no longer feel attached to having to stay wow. it's like well maybe we're not meant to be in the same room. Maybe I'm not supposed to work on this job. And that's cool because I'll get I'll get some other job or I'll work at a freaking restaurant. I don't know, you know, but uh, I'm not attached to the outcome anymore. Yeah. It's like, that's you know, it probably isn't. I was, I yeah. have a friend who's, you know, wanting to, to get into this business. I'm like, why? First of all, <laughs> um, but yeah. sometimes she'll have me work on her like stuff with her. And, and, and I always say, you've got to have a sense of abandonment. You, you can't hold on to a plan because right. it's a ping pong match, man. And then you've got to have abandonment and, and, and no sense of attachment to your own self and your own. And that's kind of life too. I feel like that's kind of my life now. Like, I feel like my face, like if someone's talking and I don't like what they're saying, unfortunately, my face makes like a, you know, <laughs> like I can't help that I'm so present that yeah. but I love that, you know, I mean, you are so, it's just, you're still brilliant and you're, you know, such a pleasure to watch. I'm such a geek. Sorry, I'm going to shut up. No, it's so it's lovely. But that is like when you think about what, you know, if people pray, what do you pray for? And really, I think all I've ever wanted was to manage what's coming at me. You know what I mean? Instead of, you know, deciding what should come at me. I don't know. I've been wrong about everything. <laughs> Never in my life would I have thought I was worthy of a job like The Sopranos mm -hmm. that's had an effect on the, on, on the, the landscape World. of television. For God's sake, I mean, I would never have have um, dared to dream something so big for myself. Oh. So the truth is, when I've stayed out of my own way, the stuff that comes at me is so much grander than anything I would have afforded myself. So I've decided to just sort of sit back, take care of myself and see what's next, see what comes next. You know, some of it's whatever good, some of it's bad. And then I change my opinions about what's good and bad, it, but it doesn't matter. It's accepting what's coming at you. That's all I want. That's all I want to be able to do. Acceptance is everything, right? That's what creates the space. Totally, totally. Every drop of pain that we experience is because we want things to be a way that they're not. If you think about anything you're in pain about, that's what it is. What if you let it go and see what you have and, yeah. and accept it? You have no that's choice anyway. The sooner you do it, the less pain you'll be in. Like that joke when people say, you know, want to know how to make God laugh, tell it your plans. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly it. That I mean, I'm big it. on manifestation and kind of having that clear road of intention in life, but you don't fucking know what's going to happen. Do you think I knew that MS was going to happen to me? Like, yeah, really? Like what? 
it's you know? a hard, that's a hard, it's a hard one to accept. Yeah. But you know, I can't say that I can imagine uh, that to, to just sort of be okay with that on some level and just say, Oh, I'm not okay with it. I'm no. only two, I'm only two years diagnosed and I'm, I wake up pissed off every single day. So I'm not yeah. in healing stage by any means. Um, Jamie has taught me a lot to have some grace about it, but um, I'm still real mad. Yeah. 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 But I think in turn, Christina has also given me the permission to n- not have a good day or say that this isn't okay or that this sucks or this is hard um, because of that bit of my personality that's just going to push through and like, no, we're going to, we're going to make the best of this. And uh, do I have aspects of this specific journey that I'm grateful for? Absolutely. Because I think it's been an incredible catalyst of my own self growth and it's really defined, um, my spirituality, um, and my sense of faith, even though you think it would rock my sense of faith, I think it's actually given me one. Um, and so for that, I will be grateful, but it's still incredibly hard. It's, you know, I don't, love to feel how I feel every day. But the ex- in the days where I can accept a little bit more than the day before is an easier day. So I do believe truly that that is my very first meditation teacher. I'll never forget. He just had this big whiteboard and he said, and then he had a desk in front of us and he had a pen and he said, this is the only thing the ego knows how to do. And he kept pushing the pen with his fingers and he kept going, I want it. I want it. I want it. I want it. Your ego has no idea what to do when it has it. Your ego only knows how to want. So put the ego in the back seat or the side. It can serve you. It can help you. You just say, no, you're not driving. But the only thing that's going to create the space to allow the universe to have the flow of the in and out of everything is acceptance. And so I'll never forget that. And I I didn't know, and I read recently that meditation, well, is it still a big part of your life, Edie? It is, yeah. Yes, it's not. I mean, it could be a bigger part of my life, but I'm not getting on my case about that either. No, but yes, it is. Yeah, it changes. I went and lived at an ashram in India in January for almost two weeks. Yeah. And I, um, and I basically just sat with this beautiful man in meditation all day and night for many, many days. And it was incredibly transformational. I'll never, I'll never be the same because of it. And I, and it was also a big moment for me because I didn't realize how curated I had been with how I had allowed people to see me with this disease. Like it took me 16 years to actually say it out loud. Um, and because of having a secret so long, I developed like all the shame around it. Right. And because it's affected the way I move and I walk and I have to walk with a cane a lot of the times, it's just, and anytime I've acted, it's always like, well, let's film around it. Let's work around it. And so I've I've just been made to feel like this is this looks wrong. This makes people uncomfortable. And to really let people see me in my daily struggle and how I move was liberating because it allowed me to accept myself a lot more, which I think is, is like the, the things that I didn't possess before, you know? And in, and in that way, you are blazing a trail for other people to allow the space for them to do the same. I can't imagine how much that's going to help people. I hope so. And that's the purpose of this podcast. Um, I wanted to ask, and I know that the, uh, I am so curious as to um, little Edie and not being Bouvier Beale, obviously, just kidding. Like you, what was the, what was your growing up like? And when, when was the moment that you knew that you wanted to take on this thing that we've been doing that is so not um, guaranteed and can be incredibly scary, but also life-changing? Like, I want to know that. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. I I was just talking to a friend about this uh, uh, yesterday. You know, my story, as I've always said, is that my mom was an actress in community theater on Long Island. She worked at Arena Players and uh, Theater 3 in Port Jefferson, you know, those those local places. And I used to go with her as a little kid and I just got the bug, you know. My God, we have like almost the same story. Sorry, go ahead. Like literally on stage because she couldn't afford a babysitter. Like, go ahead. 
That's right. I would be sitting in the audience and just, you know, I'd started to, you know, in my brain's like take notes and like, that was different from last night. <laughs> or whatever. Um, not always welcome, by the way. But um, <laughs> and they started putting me in the plays. Anyway, I just loved it. I also loved that my mother was an adult. She had a job during the day, but at night, her and her friends went and put plays on. I'm like, what? How is that allowed? It was just wow. But I think the bigger story being that my mom and I, we had a very tumultuous time of it. And uh, I wanted so desperately her um, approval and acceptance. It was, it was a non-winnable um, uh, journey, but I didn't know. And as a kid, I kept trying. So I think on some level, I became an actress because my mother didn't. My mother got married to an Italian man. She, she um, uh, became uh, Catholic and had a bunch of kids and had said many times, like, you know, I wanted to be an actress, but, you know, I had to have kids. And anyway, so I wondered if I came over that journey to do it for my mom because she didn't or because she mm. couldn't. Wow. Um, so I don't know. I always the story has always been that I loved watching my mom do it and I came to love it myself, which is also true. That's so crazy because it almost the same thing. Like my mom belonged to a, a repertory theater company. And I mean, I was always there. So in, like I said, like she just put me in the play somehow yep. and they were all like hippie weirdos and stuff like that. And then she didn't become a success doing it, but we also didn't have any money. So little, little Christina had to work. And I started working oh, at right. age three, honest, like age three. And is this California, by the way? Yeah. I'm California. from Laurel Canyon. I'm ah. I'm 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 a Laurel Canyonite, and I've been here my whole life. I've never oh my god, I've never left I've never, the canyon. I've never known a real actual Laurel Canyon. No, like actually born <laughs> and raised on Lookout Mountain. Like that's yeah, Joni Mitchell and all those yep. guys. Yeah, my mom was my dad was a um a music producer and um or whatever he did. I don't even know. He left when I was really young. So um, but there was always like we knew all the people like. Stephen Stills is like my godfather. Like this, just oh yeah. Oh my gosh. I grew up. I grew up like, you know, on the side of the stage at like Manassas concerts and Crosby, Stills and Nash and stuff like that. Um, oh like God. that was the, my mom's world. But yeah, so the, yeah, I got put to work pretty early. So I love, I love hearing that this was like then ingrained in you. That's so right. Was, it was when did you become professional? Like when? What age were well, you? I just. I was going to go, you know, you had to fill out information about what colleges you want to go to in high school and stuff. And I was like, I kind of wanted to be a therapist. I thought it was so interesting. And I figured they probably made OK money. And mm -hmm. then my, one of the teachers said to me, well, aren't you in the plays here in the school? I said, yeah. She said, why don't you become an actress? And I was like, what do you, what do you become an actress? I said, nobody <laughs> comes like you're born one, right? Like in your famous. And I, don't, I didn't know how it worked, but it didn't occur to me. It was something you could like study and go to become. But anyway, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try that. I'll go to acting school. So that's what I did. i never really imagining it was something I would do to support myself. I assumed I would do what my mom did, you know, at night I would do my plays with my friends. So, and I was not the person that was supposed to be successful. You know what I mean? Of all the people that I've met going on this acting trip that I've been on with so many people my age, they had so much more vested interest in the money fame thing. Mm -hmm. And that was never anything I could have imagined or wanted. Um, and then to look at what my life has become, it's just shocking and stultifying. And which is not to say everything about my success has been great. It's challenging too, as you guys know you know, your life is not your own. You, there's a lot of privacy issues and all that stuff. But um, anyway, none of this would I have planned. None of it. Did I plan or would I have? Yeah. Well, that kind of falls in line with what you were saying, where you kind of have gotten out of the way of how things need to be. And that's, that's everything. It is. It's a, a you make room for, for much more magnificent stuff. Mm. I have found. I agree. I always love asking this question to people because I, I, is there any, and I know this is going to be very surfacey, like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> is there anyone that you haven't worked with that you would go nuts to be able to work with? Oh God, so many. I know. I know. It's such a stupid question. I don't know why. This is what I'm thinking about. Cheryl Streep. Yeah. This is mine too. I think that's everybody's. Nobody else. Yes. Olivia Coleman, I'm crazy. Oh, um, 
gosh, let's see. Riz Ahmed. Do you guys know him? Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. He was in the night of. Yes. Love this Jeremy Allen at Jeremy Allen White guy from The Bear. Edie, you got to be on The Bear next season. Oh, my God. I hate everybody and their grandmother on that thing. Let's put it out there. No, that's right. I'll, I would love I'll put it. put it out there for I you. Love. I would love to. Assuming they're, having, they're gonna have more seasons. Anyway, I loved it. Loved I haven't it. seen it, guys. Am I the? <gasps> am I? The that's a great show genre. for you to watch. So good. I'm still in my my Bravo TV stuff, but I I know. We watch a lot of reality television. Reality TV. Yeah, we're we're very weird. We're garbage we're people. We, and no, we won't. We won't um, you feel not alone because it's everywhere. This so. is true. Yeah, I, I promise you, we we won't bore you with um, our obsession with all things Real Housewives and all things oh, Bravo. Well, right ahead. No, we, no, no, no. That's a whole other life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. OK, so I have to watch the bear. All right. I will. Yes. Yes. But yes, I mean, no, nobody out of left field, you know, uh, the answers of who I'd like to work with. It's all, the, you know, yeah, the, 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 the people, We're crazy. you know, those guys, the people. The peeps. The peeps. Oh, I would love to see you in a Scorsese film. Oh my God. He doesn't not he doesn't write, you know, amazing women, I will say. Yeah. But maybe I could be the head of a crime family. I don't know. I don't know. I did did you watch um my friend um Jennifer Esposito just directed and wrote a movie? Yeah, I saw that. And it's all female like mafia chicks. Really? What's it called? Fresh kills, I think. Yes. So you know what? New I'm ready. are turning out there. The tables are turning out there. Fresh kills. Yeah. 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 She's, she's getting great. Yeah. She's she's like doing the festival circuit with it and getting she's like a lot winning of everything, great. right? Yeah. She's kicking ass. Jennifer Esposito and I go way back. Oh really? shit, really? I mean, from like early days, like early days in New York. She and I were going to do a movie with Rebecca Miller, we, uh, who was married to, Jen, uh, to Daniel Day-Lewis, and she's Arthur Miller's daughter. Oh. She, she, a bunch of us would get together, Nick Sandow, oh my God, Jennifer, uh, a bunch of us would get together and just improv scenes, like in a loft space downtown, and she was going to make it into a movie. And um, then to go on and see Jennifer go off and do other great things. You know, Edie, we had Martin Short on and we were asking him about Jiminy Glick and he told this story when he said he interviewed you and in the middle of you answering a question, he shushed you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I'm such a freaking fan of those interviews and he totally did. And I was so taken aback. I was I was mortified. <laughs> I mean, I know the whole thing was a joke, but I was like, I hadn't been shushed in a long time, you know. But like, that's so funny. Anyway, he, uh, oh, that was. Have you guys seen the, all the Glick interviews or any yeah. of them? They're I've just, seen most of them. Yeah, it's like probably like it's like TV porn for me. Like I love it so much. And I asked him when we were doing the interview, like why I was never on, and he said because I didn't want you to be. I like, know whatever he said. He was just he like. <laughs> He was really well. He and I have been friends for twenty three years, so oh, I didn't know that. He can say whatever he wants to to me, but oh yeah, they have a love affair. It was it was oh, wonderful funny. to just sit and listen to the two yeah. of them. He truly, really darling. Yes. Well, Edie, thank you so much for yeah. like just you. In my eyes, you haven't changed a bit. You're still just everything to me and i'm just so happy to have this meaningful conversation you continue to um inspire me so much and i love you i really do sweetie that thank you so much that means the world to me and i you you have to understand that you and i have not spent a ton of time together since the show ended and to look at you now like i can get teary like my kids like my daughter you're like a grown smart beautiful like worldly woman and it happened like in the blink of an eye and it's still it takes some getting used to you know you were a little yeah. teeny kid. i know anyway i'm so glad you guys asked me i'm just um thrilled to have been included we're beyond excited and i think that you and i are going to be best friends i don't know if you're if you're ever out <laughs> here I, well yeah I'm, well, i live in westchester now whoever would get okay well they'd have jet blue don't they for somewhere but anyway come here and what uh-huh. Jamie knows is we just because my legs have been pretty bad for a while, but we just okay. lay in my in my bed, which that's where I do the podcast from. Spit and I, I have all my it. animals here and we it's just talk beautiful about bed. I'm like, where are you, Jamie? Are you in Texas? I am in Austin. 
Okay, that's what yeah, I thought. Yeah, I've been here for three years. Um, it's lovely. It's great. It's a fun place to live. My kids love it. That's great. I think I've been there too. It's a fantastic city. I love it. Yeah, it's not too far from from the other places, so it's a nice central place. Right, right, right. Yeah. Good for well, you. Thank you for giving us your time. You, it was an of course unbelievable honor for. Best of luck with this thing. Thank you. Uh, yeah. A lot of people wanting to hear what you have to say. So. We hope That's so. We're, we we try. So. All right. All the best. Isn't she delightful? Delightful. She's just, it was so crazy to hear her perspective of me. Because it, there was, it, it was this thing where like, we really loved each other. And like, there was no question of that. Like, we, we liked each other, we loved each other, but there was, there was a distance with us. And it, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. But I think it's because we were more similar, that even though she says that I was a certain type of girl, and she was a weirdo, I think we were just more similar that it was just harder for us to open up for our own reasons. It's just so weird. It's hard for, you know, for uh, the person who's playing your mother, right? To have this balance of like, you know, Katie didn't know when to step in as being a support for me mm -hmm. because I already had a mother. Mm -hmm. But the longer she got to know my mother, I think she realized that she probably should step in <laughs> sometimes. But um, no offense, mom. But, you know, there is that thing of like, this person doesn't know how, are they supposed to of protect course. you or be your peer? Or and all I wanted was for her to step to in. Step like all I wanted to protect her. you. Yeah. yeah. That's all I did. All I wanted. But, you know, my mom thanks Katie for actually raising me because she did. So I think we should get Katie on here. I was just going to say, can we have Katie on here? That's absolutely. 100%. But no, thank you so much for like, she was just so cool. Man. Look, I, that's my one ace card. I'm pretty sure. Like you have all the fabulous friends. Edie's my, Edie's my one star in my pocket that I got. I'll try to find some them. more, but she's the best. I'll give you Lance. Okay. okay. You can take that on your golf card. Okay. Your mini, your mini golf card. You can have that. Thank you. Par. You got par on that one. Wait, thank you. Should we pull our cards? Yeah, I got them right here. I have them. Oh, look at you. So prepared. You go first today. Um, tell me when to stop. Stop. Left or right? Left. Okay. Oh, well, this is so crazy. Okay. I mean, it's not so crazy, but it kind of, it lends itself it. to what we were talking about. How to stop creating time. Realize deeply that the present moment is all you ever have. Make the now the primary focus of your life. You're literally just talking about that. Like, That's it. That's it. All right. You ready for mine? Yep. Do not let your fire go out. Spark by irreplaceable spark. In the hopeless swamps of the approximate, the not quite, the not yet, the not at all. Do not let the hero in your soul perish in lonely frustration for the life you deserved, but have never been able to reach. Check your road and the nature of your battle. I know. Oh, shit. But look, I think, I think us having these beautiful conversations with people from our past and our present and are also people that we admire and that other people admire like again they, they're 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 i feel like they're reminding us of ourselves and our experiences and more of who we are despite what we deal with on a daily basis and um i'm just going to take them as reminders and beautiful interruptions from the universe in my regularly scheduled programming to just remind me that um, I'm more than this disease and my dreams are still super valid and real. And, and I hope you feel the same way. Yeah. I'm getting there, sweetheart. I know you are. I'm just not there yet. I know. I'm brokenhearted. Um, it's I okay it. though. It's okay. It's okay. I love you. I love you so much. And so it and is. so it is. We want to hear from you and answer some of your questions and read your comments. You can send them in through the contact form on our website. MessyThePodcast.com or DM us on Instagram at MessyPodcast. 
This show is executive produced by Christina Applegate, Jamie Lynn Siegler, and Allison Bresnik. Our audio engineer is Josh Windish. And if you want to show us some love, don't forget to leave the show a rating or review. Hi, it's Jamie. Thanks for listening. I just want to let you know, I am a paid spokesperson for Novartis, but this podcast is independent from my collaboration with Novartis.